Beloved, welcome to Thursdays at the Table. It is my honor to have as our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings. He is an academic, a systematic theologian, known for his contribution on liberation theologies, cultural identities, and theological anthropology. He graduated from Calvin College, received his Master of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary, and his PhD in Religion and Ethics from Duke. He's also an ordained Baptist minister and actually served several churches in his tenure. He's currently an Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at Yale. He's the author of the award-winning book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race. And he also authored After Whiteness, An Education in Belonging, which seeks to reimagine theological education. Dr. Jennings has also written a commentary on the Book of Acts for the Belief series. He is married to Joanne, and they have two wonderful daughters, Injiri and Safia. Welcome to Thursdays at the Table, Dr. Jennings. I am so glad to be with you, here with you, Bishop. What a, what a joy. Thank you so much for this invitation. Well, indeed, the joy is mine. I often uh, share as a part of this, because, you know, this whole concept is about who do I want to sit at table with hmm. and have conversation? And as you know, especially in, in our culture, when you sit at the table and you have conversation, you're going to get to the whole truth eventually, right? You, you're just going to lay it all out there. And so, so that's the concept behind this. And so I often have a, a mug before me that I feel represents the kind of conversation that I hope to have with mm -hmm. the invited guests, but also who I deem them to be, what they mean for me in the world. And so the mug that I chose for our conversation today says, be the change you wish, wish to see in the world, a quote by Gandhi. And that's how I see you. I see you as embodying the change that you hope to see in the world. You're too kind. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> well, a beautiful amen. cup. That's a beautiful cup. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And so, speaking of cups, how do you feel your cup? Are you coffee or tea? In the mornings, I'm coffee. Strong, okay. strong black, uh, nothing in it. Decaf, because at, at this point in my life, my doctor has told me, you need to go decaf. <laughs> All right. And in the afternoon, I, I, I enjoy a cup of Olong tea, and that's what I'm having right now, a nice cup of Olong tea. A cup of Olong tea. All <laughs> right. Well, I love my both and folks. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, let us then, as I say, get to the deepest things we know. You've described your younger self as being very inquisitive in general, but about scripture in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, it's been my experience that questions aren't always welcome at church. Were your questions well-received? No, my questions were not. And in part because I was such a precocious young man who hadn't learned the fine art of how to speak gently um, when someone is trying to teach me or preach to me. And so I often ask the both the obvious question, but also the difficult question in public. Mm, in public. <laughs> and that's what made it so difficult. So, And I, I had the habit of remembering what I heard. And so I would sometimes raise my hand in, in uh, Sunday school and then raise my hand in Bible study. And mm -hmm. a few times I tried, even tried to raise my hand at the end of the sermon. All right. <laughs> but I would raise my hand and I would normally say something like, Reverend, I, you know, I, I, you said this. Now, this contradicts what you said last week when you said this. Oh, my. <laughs> so help me understand what, 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 what's the difference between what you said then and what you're saying now. And I would often ask questions about, I didn't realize at the time, I'd be asking questions about the intricacies of interpretation. Ah. I said, now, where do you, where, where you see that in this, in this text? <laughs> How amazing. Now tell me how old you were when I, you were having these kinds of conversations. I, I started I started right before my teenage years and it, and it went right into the, the heat of my teenage years. And it, and it got to the point where the poor pastor, when he saw me coming, you could see the look of dread on his face <laughs> because I was going to keep asking questions. And um, 
you know, my mother and my and my dad and and uh, the and my sisters and brothers, especially my older brothers, you know, they didn't mind me asking questions. Right. But uh, my poor pastor, he it got to the point where he was he pulled my mother to the side and was really wondering about the validity of my salvation. <laughs> Well, see, it should have been quite to the contrary, because first of all, the fact that you were listening, mm-hmm. that you retained the information, yes. Yes. even the fact that you continued to be present, although if your household was like my household, we didn't really have a choice as no, to whether or not we were going to church, right? Even when I went to mm-hmm. college, I would come home on the weekend and my mother would say, I hope you remember. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly, That's exactly right. right. There, there was no, there's no such word as choice. <laughs> right, right. I was raised Baptist, but I tell people all the time, I was raised a Calvinist. You know, mm. you are going to do this because God has already demanded you do this. Indeed. <laughs> you ordained, you preordained to do this. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, but why do you think that so many pastors, um, preachers, actually resist questions. And and I've even heard some go as far as to say uh in 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 some places to ask a question is is to be challenging God. Mm-hmm. Where do you think that ethos came from in the church? I think it's it's always had two at least two streams that gave that gave it life. The one is just the classic anti-intellectualism mm. always been a part of Christianity in the Western world that um, uh, a thinking faith is um, always imagined as a a problematic faith. Mm -hmm. And so for many people to, to ask, to ask questions and to think of, think of thinking as a part of one's discipleship has always for some people, for many people in the Western Christian world been seen as a foreign alien element and thinking mm-hmm. the face on that you have that strong strong stream that continues and then the other but the other stream is the the sheer vulnerability and the um fear that often accompanies so many folk in ministry and the inability to uh face that fear head on mm-hmm. with the recognition that I don't have to always present myself as knowing everything yes that I can actually present myself as a as a learner continuing to learn but that takes a that takes a different a different not only formation but a different way of being in the world in which you invite people into deep thinking as a part as a fundamental part of their le- living right. in the faith and their discipleship right. so those two streams meant that i i often encountered ministers in the pulpit when they were approaching a difficult passage of scripture, when they're approaching a difficult topic, they often, you could see them negotiating hard to avoid the, the difficulties, right? Yes, yes. Working real hard. And the way they preached and the way they circled around it, the way they danced around it, they were often um, afraid to jump into the deep end of it. And in many ways, they were denying God's people precisely what God's people wanted, the, the space to actually speak the truth about right. themselves and about life that's right mm-hmm. there that text and at the same time also living inside for so many as you know and especially within the black church tradition who were denied opportunity for study right. and for education and so right uh, part of that negotiation was also recognizing the the lack that many ministers had when they climbed into that pulpit that they really did not have the tools that they needed. And some knew that mm-hmm. and, um, you know, tried their best to address it. And others knew that and tried their best to conceal it. Mm, right. But we right. couldn't conceal that. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> can't conceal what you don't know. No, it, eventually it will come to the <laughs> fore. It will come to the fore. So then I presume it was that kind of inquisitiveness that actually led you to a formal study of God's word. And you yeah. are a professor of systematic theology. I now, some of us hear that and, and not quite sure exactly what that means. So help us understand what systematic theology is all about. Oh, I'm glad to. So systematic theology is the study of what the church 
thinks, mm -hmm. both specifically and in the practice of thinking as a Christian. So systematic theology considers what has developed in the history of the churches thinking and the practice of thinking, that is, doctrines mm -hmm. and ways of thinking that draw on the scripture and on the way other Christians in the past and the present have articulated their life with God. And so systematic theology is, in fact, the study of the thinking of the church and, the, and then the facilitation of more precise thinking, more clarity in the thinking mm -hmm. of not only the church, but of the individual Christian. And so then when we think about what the church thinks, its doctrine, its way of thinking, when I look at scripture, when I look at the canon from Genesis to Revelation, I can't see anything except liberation. Mm. I can't, I can't see anything. Of, of course, I know that, that of course, you know, we, we start in, um, seeing the, the people before they became known as, as the Israelites, they're in bondage, but that whole story is about them being drawn out of bondage, right? So, so, so we see this mm -hmm. tension between bondage, liberation, um, being oppressed, freedom, mm -hmm. being led to the promised land. I, I, when I read scripture, I just can't see anything else. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems like in this <laughs> the, e even in the church, the way that the church has participated in oppression and whatnot, that I don't know that, that the church has always interpreted that as God's intention for the created order. So how did, how did we begin to read hierarchies of human worth into God's creation? That's a wonderful question. So, and I love the way you put that. When you read, you can't see anything else but the liberative impulse of God, mm -hmm. that God wants to have shaping the, the beating of our hearts and our lives. I think that's correct. And what that shows is really the way in which we, who are Christian, came to call this, um, this Hebrew Bible, Bible mm -hmm. of the people of Israel, yes. along with a set of loose letters and other kinds of texts written by those um, early Jewish believers, came to call all of that the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. And the way we've come to that is because we were introduced to it all through the work of redemption in the life of this Jesus of Nazareth. And that's, yes. the, that's the crucial thing. We who are Christian, we come to this thing called a Bible through the recognition that our lives have been claimed by the God of Israel, mm -hmm. known to us in one of their own, Jesus of Nazareth who we Christians came to understand, not simply as a prophet of God, but actually God in the flesh. Right. So it's that difference, it's that fundamental difference that then means when we turn to the Bible, we are turning to try to make sense of two crucial matters. One, mm -hmm. that this, this God who has redeemed us, who has shown us the light and the life and who has freed us from bondages both that we knew and bondages that we did not know right that we what we were coming to realize is that that god is actually the god who created us yes and we're trying now we have to understand okay the the gods who my people said created me actually are not is not the god who created me it's this it's the god of israel and that mm. in of itself is mind-boggling and so part of the turning is to try to understand okay, well, who is this God who actually, I mean, it's like finding out who your real daddy is. <laughs> right, right. Uh, where, where's he from? So, and so, but, but not to, we want to, that we want to hold on to that analogy softly because God's not a God. But Amen. what's important here is that it is, it is first of all, trying to make sense of who this God is. Well, that's why we turn. Mm -hmm. Then the second reality that, that drives us is that we're trying to keep up, catch up, with the reality of this redemption that has come. So we're, we have to now yield and follow the spirit of God into the life of Jesus and then follow the life of Jesus. Now, my dear sister, 
this is the bishop. Here's the, here's the problem for us. <laughs> all right, all those, right. Those two tasks are massive, mm-hmm. and Christians have always struggled to try to figure out who this God is and what does it mean to follow this God made flesh. Yes. And in that process, we have and continue to make profound mistakes, Mm. like creating hierarchies, like creating um, what we think are uh, visions that capture what this God is about, when in point Mm -hmm. of fact, they don't capture what this God is about. We continue to make mistakes. And those mistakes, those mistakes should be seen in two ways. Mm -hmm. Those mistakes are on the one hand, um, are the recognition that we needed <laughs> this salvation. <laughs> Amen. That this God brought because we 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 were deeply problematic people. And so it, on the one hand is the recognition. On the other hand, it's the recognition that we are always groping mm. to try to create that which gives witness to not only who this God is, but who we are with this God. Yes. And so hierarchies, patriarchy, forms mm-hmm. of social life, mm-hmm. ways of thinking that in point of fact, don't give witness to a God who gives life, but gives witness to death. Right. We are always caught up in that. Mm. That's amazing. Gives witness to death. So mm-hmm. again, when we force upon God, this, this notion of domination, this notion of male over against female, right. of, you know, particular flesh coming out of a particular part of the world over against other, uh, you know, as witness to death. When everything that, 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 that again, in, the, in this canon, every, every time we see Christ, and again, you remind me that I come to it through the lens of the redemption of Christ. And I receive that. I understand that. But everything about Christ is about life, mm-hmm. is about being generative, is mm-hmm. about restoration, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. and so, so what is it about our human nature that wants to slip back into this, this rendering, this, this witness of death, rather than what has been given to us through the one that, that we claim <laughs> as yeah. our Lord and Savior? Yeah, we were created. We were created for communion. Mm-hmm. We were created for life together with God and with one another. And the the struggle we have is to enter fully into that reality of communion Mm -hmm. and not fall into isolation. Right. And fall into ways of living that make life together an option, Mm. not an absolute necessity for me to be human. And so the challenge we are, we are in the midst of is entering fully into what God is calling us not only to do, mm-hmm. but to be, right. to be those whose very identity is formed in communion, which means it's an identity that glories in differences joined, mm-hmm. but not eradicated. Mm. It glories in differences joined and not eradicated. It glories in the multiplicity of the creation that God has bestowed the grace of existence upon. Mm -hmm. And it glories in being one among the many, right? Right. Being being among the, the creation and to be together in life together is exactly what God is calling us toward. But this in itself is that's that's not a fantasy that's not a utopia that right. that is the thing that establishes life and but the reality for us is that we struggle we struggle mightily and this is where i think the importance the importance of understanding the life of jesus as a boundary a boundary transgressing yes a border breaking mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's <laughs> reality right. of life. And as I like to say, you know, when Jesus comes, Jesus does this thing that is so important for us. Jesus gathers a crowd. 
And that crowd that Jesus gathers, Bishop, these are not friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. These are people, and, and I think we often run past how important the crowd is in the gospel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if, you, if you take away the crowd in the gospels, you're not going to have the gospels. Right. And in the gospel, so the crowd gathers and the crowd is made up of everybody. Friends, enemies, right. lovers, former lovers, folks who would, if you turned your back on them, mm. a knife would come out of somewhere. And next My thing Lord. you know, there'll be blood on the ground. And, and be, <laughs> All because, right. because you got enemies. You got people who have sworn that if they see that person, they will take them out. People who are have been hurt and threatened. And here they are, right? right. People from every station in life, the rich, yes. the poor, the 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 powerful and the weak. And the, the weak. Mm -hmm. Work in the military and those who have felt the military boot on their neck. So you have all of them. And here they are shoulder to shoulder. Leaning forward straining to hear right. what this Jesus is saying. Now, here's the point. Jesus wants it that way. Mm. His very life is to gather the people who would prefer never to be near each other. And, and what happens when that crowd shows up? Right. The screaming, the crying, the yelling, Jesus, please come help me. Jesus, over here, people right. reaching to grab him. You know, the disciples you know, almost at their wits end to try to keep his body from right. being torn to pieces. Right. And there was a great church writer who once said that when we see Jesus in the crowd, here's what we see. We actually see the original, or should I say, the real condition, the real reality of the creator mm -hmm. and the creature. Okay. So what Jesus shows us is what the creator in the presence of the creature and the creature in the presence of the creator. So if we were in the presence of our creator, we would do exactly what that crowd is doing. Help me, please. Ah! And, and yes. forget this man next to me who's yelling after you. He is unimportant. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. Fact, let me I need knock, help. Let me just knock him out right quick so you can just hear my voice. <laughs> that this, this is what, this is us. This is right. the creature. And right. this is how we would act if we were present, present to God. Mm -hmm. And so what this what this early writer said is that that Jesus strips away all other realities to bring us to the to the crucial reality. God is with us and we are screaming for the help we need. Now, if we take that as the beginning, mm -hmm. then here's what we know. It is out of that relation and that dynamic that Jesus seeks to form a community, a community of people who are border crossing, right? boundary, boundary transgressing. <laughs> they are together and they bring all those histories of hatred and suspicion right. and fear. And in the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, they are now told, work on this. <laughs> mm. Mm. work on this right now because and now yet, because you are here mm -hmm. disciples you're disciples of this jesus amen and yet in this 21st century we still gather as segregated bodies on sunday morning yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you talk about who came together and that Christ wanted it that way. Mm -hmm. And yet we have resegregated and continue, and even more so, I, I think, in this year of, of 2023 than perhaps we had been in some decades past. I see us moving further in the wrong direction. So if we're moving away from that, what what, what does it mean for our embodiment then? Of, of of this creator and being part of this creation that, that we're again going in the opposite direction? Yeah, we have, we have, especially in this critical moment, I'm speaking globally, in this critical moment, mm -hmm. with the pandemic having, having done um, damage to us, yes, we have allowed the fear of the other to drive us in, further into isolation. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that all the ways in which we have segregated ourselves have now been refreshed right. 
And so many people have now, whether they, they do so because they've kind of surrendered to it, or they do so because the fear has seduced them to thinking that this is the only way, mm-hmm. increasing numbers of people um, have lost faith in the possibility of a new shared form of existence. Now, the beautiful moment, the beautiful reality that we can that we can start to spy out even inside of this 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 um, downward turn, right? Is that on a planet in peril, more and more people are starting to realize that we do have a shared project in front of us. Mm-hmm. If we're going to survive, right? We have got to think our way toward each other because it's not going, it's not going to happen unless we do. Because what we can't do, we we might be able to se- segregate our lives, but we can't segregate the water. Mm, my we might Lord. be able to segregate our communities, but we can't segregate the air. Right. <laughs> we can't right. Se- segregate our foodstuffs. And what the <laughs> pandemic has showed us, we really cannot segregate our bodies. Mm. And that's what's. But now here's. I would prefer that we come to this realization negatively. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. come to it positively, that, that to be together is to come into the sight of a new possibility of thriving life that we have right. not yet we have not yet touched, we have not yet felt. Right, right. Because there is a difference to come together out of necessity to come together out of disaster right. is one thing but to come together out of an understanding that this is the this was the intention this will create beauty this will create the real imago day to come together in that way is far more positive and, and I think loving yeah. um, than to do so out of disaster you also focus in a lot of your writing on this notion of possession. Mm -hmm. and how we have misunderstood God's intention for possession. And I want to ask you a specific question around that. Mm -hmm. Do you think indigenous cultures got it more right than some of our theologies when they looked at all of creation as equal and to be revered rather than existing to support humanity's capitalistic thirst. And I'm thinking now about animism and, mm-hmm. and again, th- this mm-hmm. Native American understanding of all of created order, mm-hmm. uh, uh, again, having its own purpose and, and, and having a sense of equality and how some in the Western world have really almost called that heresy. Yeah. Um, so, so talk to us again ab- about that notion of of your notion of possession, and if some of our indigenous cultures got it more right than we did. Yeah, that that that's a wonderful question. And in fact, what we're talking about is really a way of understanding our life in the world and in places prior to what most historians understand as colonial, the colo- modern colonial period or colonial yes. modernity. Yes. And here, what we're talking about is not so much an indigenous way of understanding possession as opposed mm-hmm. to the way Christians have, uh, have thought, but really a, a, a way that the vast majority of the world understood what it means to live in the world as opposed to what happens with colonial modernity. And what do I mean by that? Uh-huh. I mean by that, that um, for so many peoples for millennia, if if you ask them, what does possession mean? Mm-hmm. If they're standing in a place, living in a place, what does possession mean? What you will hear is that they will they will articulate their life as being possessed by a place mm-hmm. that this place where we live. The, these waters, this mountain, these animals, this land, this dirt, this this landscape, it not only speaks to us, mm-hmm. it speaks through us. Mm-hmm. When our ancestors die, they join this land. Right. And with right. the land, they speak to us mm-hmm. and through us. Yes. Then if you say, but is, is this land yours? Well, okay, in a sense, now that I've said that, Mm-hmm. You could say 
that this land is ours. If you understand what I mean, based on what I just said. Yes. Now, the way I just described that, that's precisely what we see in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. We see, we see a land, the land as God's land that God gives it life, brought it into being, and that God will speak through the land mm -hmm. to the people. And then God, the land will speak through, the land will speak through the people as God wills it. Right. And so what we find with Israel is that they are in the land, but the, probably the best way to understand them having the land is to say they are a kind of cosmic renter of the land. Ah, that is the right. land, the land belongs to God. God owns right. the land. God owns because God is the creator. And and, and here we, we're using some clunky language when I said when we say God owns, but let's just mm -hmm. stick with it. Right, right. God right. owns the land. And what God says to the people of Israel is that this land that you are on, this land, uh, if you treat the widow or the stranger or the orphan poorly, right? this land will witness against you. Mm. And God actually talks to the land, talks about the land as though the land is alive and animate. Like the right. land is another actor. Okay. And and in fact, there's one passage in Leviticus where God says that if you if you misbehave on the land, the land will vomit you out. Out. That's right. That's right. And so it not so now let's bring that forward. So many indigenous cultures the world over. What 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 I just said is like precisely the way they would talk about if they ever right. used the word possession. Right. That's what they will talk about. Right. The European colonialist, when he came to the New Worlds, wherever we're talking, whether we're talking with the Americas or what came to call America or Canada or, you know, what came to call the Caribbean, wherever right. we're talking, when they came to those places, they brought a different vision of possession. Mm -hmm. Right. For them, it was not being possessed by, mm -hmm. like it was for the indigenous peoples, the land speaking through us, the right. land, the land in a sense, giving us the logic of our very existence. Mm -hmm. It was possession of. Of, okay. So they came and they said, no, the way we understand possession is that you own it. Right. And, right. Um, and we have a specific set of conditions by which you can claim to own the land. Right. And if you don't mean, if you don't meet those conditions, then that land is considered, the word is terra nullis, empty. Mm. That is, is land that anybody can take because it is not owned. And what they forced upon indigenous peoples is that if you're going to be able to keep this land that we're trying to take you out of, right. you have to accept the way we look at land. Mm. You have to stop saying, the land speaks to us. We don't care about that gibberish. <laughs> you have to say, we own exactly 17,000 acres, acres from here to there. Mm -hmm. That's our mm -hmm. land. And we will enter into negotiation with you about how much of the land we will sell to you. All of that foreign, foreign, strange right. ways of thinking. Now, why is all this so important for us? And this gets back to your wonderful question. Why this is so important for us is that if we do not have a sense of the land as alive, mm -hmm. or animate, right, a living reality that is in relation to us and to God, then the vision we'll have of the land is as dirt, mm -hmm. stuff that we can do whatever we want to with it, right? Change however we want. And, and we will have the idea that the land basically is like a slave to us. We can do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And the land has no voice, no say in the matter. And then we can treat the land as a commodity. As a commodity, property. that's right. Right. And so then it becomes, it, we can cut it up, fragment it, put on what we want to, and we can, we can, if there are things that we want to dump on it, we can do it because it's land and it's our land. Right. 
That is the reality that Christianity helped to create against its own older, more ancient, shared vision of the land as alive and living. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are inside that history. So I always tell people, you know, we really can't get to the bottom of the ecological catastrophe and how we address it until we come to a, a, an actual Christian vision of land as living, as a creature right. like us right. that needs to be treated as a co-creature like us. And until we come to that, we will continue to talk about the land in terms of stewardship and how we use it better, how we can manipulate it better, how we right. share it. All of that at one level, it's okay to talk that way at one level, but at the most fundamental level, it still treats the land as a slave. Well, exactly. And it's still, when I hear you speaking, it makes me think about, as I've heard some other theologians put it, this illegitimate expropriation of our neighbor's land, right? Uh, it, it still has an illegitimacy to it because it could turn on a dime. Right. And we could get back again to this ownership through conquering, ownership through domination, rather than what I heard you talking about was an ownership through relation, right? right. Uh, from right. dust we have come into dirt, dust and dirt we shall return and speaking through embodying that land again, rather than through uh, violence and domination. Right. And that's so difficult for us. We have been shaped the, and this is a part of the, as I call, the pedagogy of the colonial moment. We have right. been shaped, all of us, right. that the first time we look out on any horizon, any landscape, any land, the first question we have been habituated to ask is this, mm -hmm. owns it. Right, that's right. That's the that's first right. question we've been habituated to ask. That's and exactly what we have to right. understand, that's a marvelous and I mean marvelous in the negative sense, that's a marvelous <laughs> achievement of creating a demonic vision. Just call it what it is, demonic. I mm -hmm. like that again. So I told you at, at this table, we're gonna get to <laughs> we're gonna get to the whole truth. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a demonic understanding. And but but so many would recoil Absolutely. from that, that use of Absolutely. that term. Absolutely. They would think that what's wrong with that? And right. what's wrong is with that is. When you ask that question, it is tantamount to asking, whose slave is this? Mm, my God. My God. Well, in this same vein, because we know that what you've been describing is what was inherent in things like the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny. That's really what, what this began to lead to. Now, just a few days ago, the Pope mm. apologized, right? Yes, yes. for the doctrine of discovery and how it was used to rationalize Europe's conquests. Yes. And it's funny because I have on my, I have, here's the question, is this remarkable <laughs> or is it too little too late? <laughs> so, um, what does it mean that the Pope has now apologized for that um, lo these many years later? Listen, I, with this Pope and, um, not his most immediate predecessor, yes. but yes. the Pope before that one. Yes. We we had those moments in which from the from the papal office, from his chair, the Pope spoke words that I I applaud because they they do two things. They acknowledge, and mm -hmm. this is so they acknowledge a history of Christian wrongdoing which is fundamental to the re, to the work of repentance that we as Christians always do. We repent because this is what it means to be Christian. Right. But the second thing it does is that it alters a trajectory of thinking that moved out from that those original papal decisions right. that then shaped ways of doing theology, ways of understanding church and ways of understanding the Christian life. So by the Pope saying, I am we as the leader of the church, mm -hmm. as Christ's messenger on the earth, I say we apologize, we repent for what we've done. That is beautiful because it then will say to so many people, this question, bring this question to them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. How has this idea of discovery worked itself down deep into the bones of Christian sensibility, of theological sensibility, of church sensibility? And it has worked itself down into the bones. It's worked itself down into the bones, as I've often said, by creating a situation where the church and Christians have been shaped to see themselves as teachers first. Yes. And learners second. Mm. Because to discover means that you have arrived at a place where you have entered knowing that you should be in charge. Mm. Your discovery means that you have positioned yourself to now explain to everyone else <laughs> that they have been discovered. <laughs> right, right. You you thought you thought you had an existence you before we got here, but we have now discovered you. Have now you. Been discovered. <laughs> because before you were invisible to everything, it's including to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I have oh discovered you. And so that 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 framework is so deeply embedded, mm-hmm. first inside of a certain reality of Christianity, but then it it's like it's like a pregnant uh, a, a a woman pregnant with with with, with uh, not just twins but with triplets mm. that it gave birth to a, a a reality of Western thought, yes, Western education. Yes. That always imagines the rest of the world in need of being taught, mm. developed. We use that language to this very moment, the developing world. What does that mean? Right, right. You the whole world outside the West as developing? Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As, and it, that, that very language itself grows out of the doctrine of discovery. Right. So having the Pope say this, has been such an important thing. And also the Pope's recognition that it established a way of engaging people that at this point is counterproductive right. to the witness of the living God mm. found in Jesus of Nazareth. Amazing. Amazing. You talk about what it's meant to the church. Again, these these doctrines, these philosophies, these foundational notions uh, that folks held. It also meant something to the public square, mm-hmm. um, to governments, because things like eminent domain, yeah. right? Uh, the, the the notion of still being able to move in to displace to take but be, because we have the right, we have the superseding need. So even the way that we relate through our governmental entities was affected by things like that. And, and that eminent domain shows up so often in communities of color. I think about a community that I pastored in Boston Mm-hmm. That had it, it was a a, a wonderful community, uh, some something like what you talked about the the crowd that gathered around mm-hmm. uh, Christ because it, it was people of color but they were of varied ethnicities mm-hmm. and th- I don't think it was there was the the most wealthy there but middle class mm-hmm. a, and below mm-hmm. were there mm-hmm. but it was taken by eminent domain now they were promised right? Mm -hmm. That they were going to be relocated and and they would be able to stay together as a community. Of course, that didn't happen because it rarely happens. These promises are made to these communities, but it rarely happens. But but this same notion Mm -hmm. of this colonialist idea of the majority being able to come in and displace the minority still exists today out of this same kind of philosophy. Absolutely. And that's, that's discovery and development and domain are, are a straight line. Right. And what you're naming is the, the fundamental problem of the idea of terra nullis, that something is empty mm-hmm. and therefore in need of being brought into proper use. And so those who have been empowered to bring it to proper use. The way I mm-hmm. put it is to bring it to maturity. Right. Claim the right. And they claim it as a kind of moral right mm-hmm. to do what's best for that land mm. as they claim the right to do what's best for those people. Right. right. And it's precisely that, that vision that I'm going to bring it 
to maturity, bring it to where it can be most productive, that so many governments, as as nations formed, mm -hmm. understood that that was a fundamental power in their hands. Right. To look out on the world and to ask, in terms of the, the space that is in their domain, what is its best use? Mm. And then they would always add, for the sake of the common good, for the sake of right. the people. Right. But we always knew that the crucial part of that sentence <laughs> is the first part. <laughs> what can it be used for? Oh, right. I forgot to add, oh, for the sake of the common good. But yeah, but, but let's stick with the first part. Of that right. Sentence. And right. that's we are we are deeply inside that. I mean, this is a problem I'm speak, thinking a lot about these days. It's the problem of real estate, mm -hmm. the problem of a developer class that is primarily hidden across the world. Right. That's right. It's that's the right. Problem, it's the problem of an engineering and architectural class that often functions without a moral compass in mm. what they envision, what they create, and what they do, and it's those. At, in every sector of society that benefit by having the fundamental decisions about the very structure of our living mm -hmm. taken out of the hands of the people, taken out of any kind of democratic process, right. and made the domain of just a few. Mm. And, you know, I, I have seen so many in so many places where decisions that should be for the many. Right. I made by the two. Not even That's the right. Few, the two. That's right. That's and right. Sometimes the one. The one. That's exactly right. Beloved of God, what a powerful, inspiring conversation I had with the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings. I'm so grateful for his wisdom, intellect, and research. The conversation was so rich that we don't want to cut it short. So you'll be able to see part two of this conversation when we launch season two of Thursdays at the Table. Until then, I pray that you will extend your table to invite others to sit with you and that together you could offer and receive the whole truth. May God richly bless you. <laughs>